much later. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining. Uh, we've got great audience here. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our, our panelists today, Crystal and Tiffany, uh, who are going to be going very deep into research ops, uh, their, their paths into the role, uh, how they're thinking of designing their role in, in their unique uh, organizations. And uh, we've got about 45 minutes of questions uh, already prepared for the panel. Uh, and then we'll do about 15 minutes of Q&A, uh, thanks to those who already submitted some questions uh, online. Uh, and throughout the conversation, definitely feel free to jot questions in the in the chat. Uh, and just to give you a quick intro on myself before handing it over to the panelists, um, Oren Friedman, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Rally, and we're building a user research CRM. Uh, so it's a single platform for research teams and their stakeholders to automate participant management and recruitment. Uh, so feel free to reach out after if you have any questions or want to chat more about it. Uh, but for our panelists, uh, we'll start with Crystal. Uh, I would love to give uh, or hear a quick introduction on yourself and uh, if you can give an overview of how you define research ops within the context of your organization. Great, happy to be here. My name is Crystal Kubitsky. I'm glad to be chatting with all of you today. I'm the UX research operations lead for MongoDB, and I live in the greater Philadelphia area with my husband and two sport-loving kids. Um, Although the practice of research has been going on for quite some time at MongoDB, research operations is fairly new. We have a small but mighty research team with a lot of several new members that have joined kind of the same time as me, which about four months ago or, or just a little bit lo longer than that. But our design team is large and they're encouraged and enabled to conduct research on their own. So research operations at MongoDB really is intended to support optimizing that practice of research and enabling quality insights from both our research team and from the designers who are enabled to do research. We initially are focusing on supporting participant management, the biggest issue that every researcher faces, um, establishing and reinforcing efficient, compliant, ethical processes so that we can make sure the quality of our research and the impact of that has a, on the best footing that it can and enabling the socialization and amplification of those insights. So making sure we can reuse and squeeze the most out of it and then getting those insights out broader into the organizations so they can have a bigger impact than the initial design decisions or product decisions that they were intended to serve. There's a lot that we can talk about in those spaces. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I see a, a webinar series here for, for each of those <laughs> each of those topics. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Tiffany. I uh, would love to hear your introduction as well and, and how you define research ops. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm Tiffany Glasscock. I am the research ops professional at Pindo. I've been in this role since, um, let's see, June of 2021. So I know I crossed over my, my one-year mark recently. Um, our research team is a team of seven, so we're pretty small. Um, and our designers, I would say about double, double that if we're just talking about the sizes of our research and design team. Research operations at Pindo, um, I would say it's about providing support for other research initiatives across the product organization, um, not just within the UX research team. And this sometimes goes beyond what we think of traditionally as product. So this means that I'm working to support UX research and design, brand design, product management, um, and sometimes the marketing team as well. A large part of my day-to-day -day is maintaining our research panel, teaching and training, the orchestration of recruitment, um, and helping to share the impact and insights of our research team. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll start with a, a fun question about your backgrounds and your, your history. Uh, we'd love to hear more about your each of your paths into research ops. Uh, Tiffany, if you'd like to kick us off. Yeah, I'll start off. Um, so my path, it was non-traditional, which is not uncommon, uncommon for those in research operations. Um, I have an academic background in physical sciences, and I started my career in academic research. Um, I discovered, that's where I pretty much discovered like my interest in questionnaire design and knew that I was very detail oriented early on. Um, so from academic research, that's when I started to explore market research. Um, and I was in a position where I was in B2B consulting and also consumer markets. Um, 
And by that time in my career, I knew which part of the research process that I enjoyed, and it was the process. Um, I feel like I was always the one in the room that was identifying when the team was being a bit hasty and taking risks and not thinking about all the small details that not only make a project successful, but makes it done responsibly and in a repeatable way. So I, those traits just naturally lent itself to research ops. Um, so from there, I was able to find a wonderful position um, in the ops field with a great organization that I was able to build my career with. Wonderful. Uh, how about how about yourself, Crystal? So much alignment there, Tiffany, on the things that we love to do and the, the value that we bring to the team. Um, this is my first time exclusively focused on research operations um, working at MongoDB. Prior to that, I spent the last 10 years managing research teams or UX teams with researchers and people who do research on it. And I suppose it puts me into your little bucket of 11% of reops folks whose pre previous experience was UX research per your like pathways into research ops survey that just went out. Um, but throughout my time as that research manager, I'm no stranger to the challenges of research operations. None of my teams had dedicated research operations as a function as it's designed and defined today. And most of the activities would fall to me or shared with members of my team. Um, over the years, establishing practices, you know, guiding researchers, facing the need to scale, there's always more research than there are researchers to do and the need to move faster than we're able to with the smaller team. I found myself more excited about those types of challenges about scaling and ensuring that we have ethical compliant research practices that deliver quality insights so focusing a lot on those problems led me to this opportunity to work with um, a great research leader and partner on this journey awesome awesome yeah love to hear the pathways they're definitely always coming from from different directions but uh, some similarities there with you both recognizing uh, your you know, interest and, and passion for driving good research uh, and, and scalable research and research that drives great results. So I'h uh, love to hear that. Uh, awesome. So shifting topics a little bit, uh, I'd love to discuss uh, the the topic of making the case for scaling uh, research within within the organization. Uh, so I know Tiffany, you joined Pendo uh, about a year and a bit ago, uh, and you were one of the earlier uh, hires on the, the team there. Uh, so we'd love to hear a bit more about uh, how you think folks should be thinking about building the case for uh, both budget and headcount and uh, scaling the, the research function within an organization. Yeah, I, you know, it's a it's a tricky question because both Crystal and I are here because someone made the case for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Someone made the case before we joined our companies um, for a place uh, in, in our role. So I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the context that I was allowed um, within our organization. And I also have a bit of an interesting background when I started Pindo, when I started with Pindo. It wasn't the traditional, you know, we have a research team and now we need to operationalize things and make sure there's process around around what we're doing and how we're democratizing certain aspects of our research. We had one researcher and then we hired an, an ops. So we kind of had the reverse um, experience at Pindo and it's been working well for us. Um, so when I think about making a business case for scaling research operations, I think you're advocating for, um, sorry, when you're scaling research in your organization, you're advocating for a research operations role. Um, so. For us at Pendo, uh, we started by gathering the amount of time that our team was dedicating to things like recruitment, start to finish. Um, how much time are they dedicating to project planning? Are they, um, are, is this in a repeatable fashion? Are there processes that we can put in place to make this more streamlined in the future? Um, how much time are they dedicating to programming tests and various tools? Are we all using the same tool? Do we all have access to that tool? Um, so compiling reports, how much time is that taking? So it's a lot of, you know, researching with your researchers to know how much time they're dedicating in these different areas of their day-to-day. -day. So oftentimes time is currency, like Crystal mentioned earlier, how can we do this faster, right? So we were able to identify the areas that we were spending the most time, document that, 
and share that with our leadership for awareness. In our case, we're building um, a case for research operations and streamlining our tool stack, um, not only our tool stack, not only adding an operations uh, professional to the team. So we're making sure that like our tool stack doesn't have duplicates. We don't have a tool for unmoderated and moderated, a tool for panel management, a tool for video transcription. Maybe we can find a tool that encompasses this all together. So a lot of that administrative work could roll into an operations role as well, right? So with the aim to recapture that time for our researchers and designers to perform their craft, um, the work that they've been hired to do, we at Pendo focused on three areas of improvement. We wanted to reduce time to insights, avoid the echo chamber that we were experiencing with some of our research, um, and increasing data quality. So for data quality and echo chamber, one of our ways to mitigate that is we wanted to implement our own panel, which requires maintenance, requires governance. I'm preaching to the choir with this group. <laughs> um, so that was evidence and that was, um, you know, fodder for us to have an operations professional on our team. Another method that you can use when you're trying to um, visualize or make a case to senior leadership for an operations role or for scaling your research team is to visualize the current process. Um, so for us, we have this great visualization of a flow chart that's branching, you know, erratically and showing all the areas of the process, all the fringe cases that are happening, um, taking that flow chart and really identifying the areas that you can streamline, um, and just, and showcasing that in a, in a visualized way. So that was really powerful when we were sharing that with stakeholders, um, and senior leadership to make a case for for scaling our research team and adding a research operations role. I love that. I love that. I'm sure everyone here would uh, die to see that that flow chart. Uh, but I'm sure it's confidential <laughs> as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for that uh, very detailed overview. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, awesome. Just uh, shifting to the next question. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of folks here have seen and read uh, Emma Bolton's very famous piece on the eight pillars of research operations. Uh, if you haven't, would highly recommend checking it out. Uh, we can follow up with it uh, in the in the follow up. Uh, and for new folks in research ops, uh, whenever I, I talk to them, uh, I hear the same thing that it can be overwhelming uh, for folks to uh, see that framework and see all the things that they need to do, <laughs> how many things that they need to work on each of those. Uh, pillars sometimes feels like a full-time job. Uh, so the age-old question uh, that everyone has to encounter when they're in a in a new role, uh, especially in a new function uh, like the one that you all are in, how do you prioritize what to work on? Uh, so for Crystal, would love if you can kick us off being three months into your role leading reops at MongoDB. Uh, would love to hear how you're prioritizing what to what to work on. Yes, this is this is my life at the moment. I get it. That framework is beautiful. It's a great reminder. It covers a lot of detail, especially when they they put pace layers over top of that. Like a lot more things started to click for me. Um, but it, I, I see it too as difficult as a practical day to day tool with my partners. And so I've kind of leveraged that behind the scenes, but really found more success in adapting the Nielsen Norman Group's framework for research operations and kind of, you know, tearing that circle apart into a line, starting with participants and ending with advocacy and using that as kind of like my left to right prioritization. Um, I take that and I've used the pillars and kind of expanded what each of those buckets mean, what participants mean, what all that, because there is a, a definition that's offered by NNG, but it doesn't cover enough stuff. Um, and it wasn't meant to, it, it admittedly says it was not comprehensive and that's, that's fair. Um, but I've used that to kind of walk through an exercise to capture what's happening today, who's involved in this today, where are the cracks and gaps, Where's the duplication? Where's the opportunity for efficiency? Where's the risk? And after going through that exercise, left through right, then I, we can identify and prioritize opportunities, leaning more towards the most common challenges with participant management that every researcher and uh, person who does research faces, and then trying to just do one thing at a time 
one thing that's small enough to provide the best impact and, and keep moving. You can't do everything at once. Emma even says that, take a breath. You can't work on them all every day. You just make progress on some and keep making sure that you're covering each of those categories. It's so important to remember that. But emphasizing the pain points and uh, from left to right of that like model participants to advocacy was how I'm prioritizing my work and the opportunities that are going to have the greatest impact and the greatest success to setting us up for more enhancements later. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, really focused on the foundation. Uh, and I love that visualization of, of left to right. You know, just how we <laughs> read, at least in the in the West. Uh, yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. Cool. And Tiffany, how about yourself? Uh, I know you've already been in, in your role um, at Pendo for, for over a year now. How has prioritization evolved uh, as you have moved from, from left to right? Yeah. So how I mentioned earlier, we were a very small team when I initially joined last year. Um, so my priorities were what's on fire <laughs> at that time, right? So um I went, I was solely tackling ad hoc requests and like, where can I be the most helpful? There wasn't a lot of structure at that point. Um, we just didn't have time to, to put it in place yet. Um, so early on, I was solely tackling ad hoc requests creating, and trying to create process around those needs. Um, so early on, um, I was also creating templates for common evaluative tests that we were trying to to have our designers have more ownership in. Um, you know, we at Pindo, our, our philosophy for democratizing research is, you know, we want to have the guardrails in place and we want to make sure that you feel comfortable performing those tests, you feel comfortable doing that research, and we are setting you up for success. Um, not just giving the research and saying, you go do this, I have more uh, discovery work to do, something more important to, to um, research with. So we definitely want to make sure that the team feels comfortable um, running those tests. Um, I was also prioritizing the screeners for common audiences. So much like everyone on this call, you have different use cases um, for different areas in your product or what whatever you're researching. Um, so making sure that we are identifying the correct participant when we are researching was very, very important for us and for our team. Um, and then early on building our research panel. So a lot of time was spent in that recruitment pillar and that admin pillar from Emma's work, um, which I, I know a lot of people on this call can relate with. Recruitment takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of attention. Um, so of course, you know, now a year later, there are still times that I am recruiting for urgent requests um, or urgent projects. But as an organization and as a team, we are trying to move more toward that famous double diamond model. Um, so at our early stages with our team, you know, we were primarily in that evaluative side of the diamond. Um, and now that our team has grown and that we have processes in place um, to work with our designers, to pick up some of that evaluative work, we now have room to explore that early discovery side of the diamond. So in order to do that, we now have the templates in place for plug and play uh, testing tools. The screeners have been developed and they're easily accessible for the team in, in one place, right? It's a, there's a central place for all of that information. Um, recruit, recruitment for me does still take time, um, but we've been able to put processes in place that now from a you know largely from my perspective it's a gate a gatekeeping um you know i'm doing checks and balances on the team to make sure that we're recruiting with the right audiences um so that has been like the timeline for how my my priorities have shifted and and most recently my priority has been building our repository uh and making it useful and accessible throughout our organization and to make sure that we are constantly sharing our insights and our findings um so making sure that this repository is searchable for our stakeholders and useful um, throughout the organization. So that's my most recent priority. So, you know, back in June or when I started with Pindo of last year, did I think that this was what I would be doing a year later? No, it, it felt like it was yeah. very far away, um, but I'm very happy to be where we are and to see like this light for this repository that's been, you know, one of our main goals since I started. It's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of hard work goes into that and uh, definitely 
you know, this whole construct of left to right also reminds me of the maturity ladder uh, that Nielsen Norman Group has has also put together, uh, where you know you have kind of this cascading pieces of uh, you know more more and more uh, maturity as the as the organization starts to, to put in the groundwork. Uh, wonderful. So we do have a, a question on the fly uh, for for you, Crystal. Uh, if you're <laughs> if you're cool with it. Uh, so the question from Michelle is, did you actually take your stakeholders through the UX pillars or through the uh, NNG uh, framework to show them that, or was that more your own organizational system for prioritization? Both. Um, it's, it's my own. I've done it in other places as a research manager, used it in order to help prioritize for my team the work that we're working on that um, relates to operations to help smooth our research processes. Um, but in here, I've used it um, more locally within the research and the research operations team. We have a team of two, so I'm very glad to have the support of, of Elisa um, on my team um, and really gone through the exercise of assessing and, and cataloging all the stuff that's happening. Um, and then I've used that framework to share out to the broader design team, the broader organization that we're directly supporting to communicate the, the functions that we offer, what we're working on, why we're working on it, and the order that we're working on, um, and just continuing to make that aware generate that awareness of the value that we can bring. As we are so young, being able to measure that value um, is gonna take a little bit of time as we put things in place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you gotta start measuring first before you can actually figure out you know, what the what the real value drivers are. Yep. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, Tiffany, you got a couple of questions here on, on tools as well. So uh, if you can quickly walk people through what tool or platform you're using for the templates uh, that people access outside of the research team and then for the repository. Yeah, easy answer. We're using Dovetail for both. Um, we were using uh, Google Drive to you know, have our multiple folders and we thought everything was very organized and people get this scheme schema, right? That's in our head, <laughs> um, but that didn't prove true. So now we have, um, we're using Dovetail for our repository and we're also using it for to house our our documentation. So, if you use Dovetail, you know what I mean. But um, and this is not sponsored by Dovetail, by the way. <laughs> this is just what we use. Um, in Dovetail, you can templatize your projects, um, and so within those projects, um, someone can leverage any research template that you provide. So, for example, in our Dovetail template, we we have a template for the research plan that we ask people to fill out, our designers to fill out. We have a template for discussion guides. Um, so you can add all of your templatized materials and documentations um, within that project within Dovetail. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so going to move on to the next question here. Uh, and this was something that was submitted many, many times uh, throughout the Google form we sent out a few weeks ago. Uh, and it's another age-old question, uh, is measuring the, the value and, and impact of, of research ops. Uh, and Tiffany, you kind of pointed to this a, a couple of, of times uh, in your uh, conversation already, but would love to hear how uh, you've thought about kind of orchestrating and measuring impact so far and how this is uh, evolving in the, in the future. Yeah, I think, um... Like with anything, it's best to start small, right? We internally, and my, my manager is actually on the call, Jeanette Putella, so she knows exactly what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, vanity metrics, you can call them vanity metrics, right? These are things that you can easily count. Um, so what we did to start showing um, our impact was simply start tracking the pure number of engagements or studies that you're having with your users. Um, you're tracking the number of participants that you're able to reach reach out to. So your touch points, right? You can track the variety of methods that you're starting to utilize. Um, so you can start to document and visualize like how diverse our methods um, are being across are are across the board. And all of these metrics, right? They're showing how much diversity that you have in research. Um, and how much like pure output output the team is able to perform because you have a, a operations person in place. 
Um, now, since we we have we've tracked all we've tracked those metrics and we have a good two years under our belt, so you can start to see that trend line start to increase, right? Um, so now we're starting to measure engagement uh, with our team. So with our repository, um, we are able to start monitoring uh, engagement for some of our research outputs. So. So we're really trying to focus on keeping our research deliverables, reports, data, all of that in the, rep the repository that I mentioned earlier. Um, so within Dovetail, and because I do work for a product analytics plat platform, um, we have a bit of a luxury that we are able to monitor those engagement metrics. So we can identify where a researcher navigated to find a resource within our repository. Um, so we're hoping, you know, by proxy, we can see how much engagement across the organization this repository has, how much engagement people are um, attributing to the research team, and how often they're coming into the repository to find information that we've already researched, right? How much digging are they able to self-serve um, with the repository? So we started small with vanity metrics, things that we can count, and we're starting to move into more of like engagement metrics. Wonderful. That's where I'm starting as well is just the collecting of the vanity metrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to do a follow up with you, Crystal, maybe in a, a year or something. See, see how the evolution has gone. Awesome. Uh, so another thing that we've we've talked about a little bit here is uh, the reality that you're you're coming into organizations with all types of folks who are doing research uh, already and uh, getting a little bit meta, but research ops folks are, in the sense of the way, researchers of researchers. Uh, so it'd be great to hear how each of you has kind of gone through the process of essentially benchmarking your teams uh, through research. Uh, and maybe Crystal, you can kick us off. Yes, and it's so great that you say that because I am a researcher, so I didn't get to yes. you know, throw that away by stepping over to the operations <laughs> side. But Absolutely. so um, in my in my new role, I'm doing a lot of evaluation, a lot of analysis, and a lot of um, charting of what's happening, collecting of what's happening now um, to set me up to benchmark later. I've done a service blueprint of the participant management experience. Um, I've also um, been leveraging the great insight from Talua uh, Awodie. I hope I didn't mess up her name. Um, so earlier this year, she shared um, a benchmarking survey, kind of a tool that she's using over in Mentive. And that has set kind of the starting point for me to build something similar, but a little different for our space so that we can measure how confident uh, people feel in performing the capabilities and activities without assistance, how helpful the avenues of assistance that exist today are to them, what areas they would prioritize that we address, training and resources they'd like to see. And I'd like to be able to send that out in Q4 now that I've got like a good sense of like where everything is who's working on all the things um, I know where to direct this kind of benchmark to and to get that kind of baseline data as far as like how often I would run this that's to be determined in my head I'd love it to be quarterly because I'd love to think that we'd be able at least initially measure impact at that scale but it, it depends on how quickly we're able to make measurable and reasonable improvements within a quarter so it might be biannual um, initially at first Wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad you're currently going through this process and that yeah, you didn't have to throw out any of your research skills. You're probably getting even more now in the uh, the ops role as well, which is cool. Awesome. How about your yourself, Tiffany? Yeah. So my response is very similar to Crystal's. Um, it sounds like a lot of us were at Tulua's talk and we got inspired by her her benchmarking, um, benchmarking work. So yeah, actually, for, for the benchmarking aspect on our team, I cannot take credit for this. This is all um, my wonderful colleague, Tanner. Um, so this is being led by her. Um, this is actually in response to training, uh, a training program and curriculum that we're starting to develop on our team. Um, so we took to Lewis framework. And just as Crystal said, we had like all these evaluative methods, moderation, uh, user, uh, research moderation. Um, all these skills 
that maybe we could lead a talk on or lead training on. And we wanted to understand how comfortable were our designers and other researchers, um, how comfortable were they when executing these types of tasks, right? So from that benchmark, we started to build our curriculum. Um, and just recently, we're, we're just rolling it out. So just recently, we had trainings for moderation best practices, some evaluative methods, um, and training related to some of our research tools as well. So yeah, very similar to you, Crystal. <laughs> great, that's great. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll share the uh, the benchmarking uh, doc after after the call as well, because I'm sure some people haven't seen it quite yet. Yeah, but that, yeah. awesome. So uh, I know we've talked a lot about so far uh, kind of the, the journeys that you've been on uh, with, with research ops, uh, the organizations you've come into, uh, how you've already started to influence amazing change and, and the impact that that change is already driving. Uh, but I'd love to take a step back and look forward uh, for the next couple of years and hear a bit more about each of your visions for how the role of research ops is going to continue evolving, uh, maybe in the context of your own organization or in the context of the industry at large. Uh, maybe Crystal, you can kick us off here. So now you're being tasked with answering this question uh, right now. So we'd love to hear, yeah, your your thought process and what impacts uh, you hope to have on on the organization in the next few years. Yeah, um, and like so many new disciplines out there, new fields, I am anticipating more growth in research operation teams and more specialization or focused attention to occur. That's what you see, you know, in all the different types of disciplines that happen and what we're starting to see already in research operations and some of the mature established practices, particularly larger research organizations. Um, some of those specializations that I'm seeing and that I'm very interested in also being able to move into with my organization is obviously a deep focus on participant management and experience. There is a whole experience and a service related to that, that we've been able to expose to our service blueprinting exercise of, of how we can make part, being a participant with us, participating in our research and giving us feedback feel good. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we can do in that space and love to provide a lot of focused attention to that. Secondly is the democratized research program management. It is not going to go away no matter how um, tainted the word democratized research might be, how, how, com um, how, how that's defined in different places. People are going to do research. Let's make sure that that research is done in the best way that it can be. So having someone focus on how to do that in the organization that you're in would be another great focus area for us. We already are democratized before I got here. So there's a lot of work that we can do to make sure that the quality of those insights, the pace of those insights, and the availability of those insights can you know, reach farther and have more impact. Um, and research insights and knowledge management, a natural thing there, something, mm -hmm. Tiffany, I know you guys have moved into, and that's, that's awesome. It's super exciting. And having a library science background, that's like a you know, fun little nerdy thing for me, um, but making sure our insights are findable, making sure they can be atomic, making sure that they can be used beyond the initial purpose if they are, um, or at least discovered so that you can make that judgment as to whether that's useful information um, for the, the project that you're in or whether you need to expand and extend beyond that. Um, tool management and optimization is another one. There's so many tools out there like you guys rally, <laughs> but there, there's a lot of new tools coming out. It's difficult to be able to pick up and learn how to use those efficiently. And it's so quick where you can start feeling like the tool is just not a great tool if you don't know how to effectively use it. And if we have tools here, we want to invest in our team, understanding how best to use those and guide our um, researchers on how to leverage them in the variety of ways that they're optimized to be used. And then separately, research practice governance. There's competency in here. How can we onboard? How can we you know, make sure that the process is clear? All kinds of stuff around, um, around, around the, the process that I think needs special attention. So these are kind of in my priority order of how I would like to move to have special areas of focus within my team. Um, but the first three are the biggest that I would be looking for. 
the Participant Management Democratized Research Program and the Insights and Knowledge Management. Yeah, <clears throat> I love that. I think it's a great vision. You've got your work cut out for you uh, over the next few years. Multi-year plan. <laughs> Multi-year plan. And yeah, I love uh, as well, uh, you know, this this concept uh, with within democratization of, of training and enablement, uh, you know, in a lot of other operations uh, type roles that are adjacent to research, like, for example, in sales operations, there's folks out there uh, under those teams that are specifically called sales enablement and sales trainers, and they teach reps how to do the job effectively within the context of their organization, because uh, research evolves within different organizations and contexts as well. Uh, and I haven't yet seen that role in, in research, but in research ops, but that might be a, a really interesting one down the line. Cool. Tiffany, would love to hear your vision uh, for, for how the role is going to continue to evolve and, and grow over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of my focus, like I mentioned, is with building a repository. Um, and it is a lot of work. There's a lot of podcasts, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of blog posts around like, how can we make a repository useful? Um, you know, insights grow stale, find, our findings are not, they can't transverse, you know, multiple topics within your organization. How do you write a real insight, a durable insight, right? Those are difficult things. And we are still working through that as a team. I don't want to say we have it all figured out. We do not. Um, so my, um, how I see adding impact uh, later in my organization is building this repository and making it cross-functional. So we are really embracing this insights repository. Um, and the goal is to not limit the insights repo to just research and design. Um, we definitely want to make this a central knowledge, um, a central point of knowledge. So pulling in other data sources, other primary research within the organization, and being able to connect those dots um, and having research as an area of support, right? Um, so we are currently, we're exploring adding in some of our competitive intelligence and market research um, deliverables and being able to tag those efficiently and connect those to pieces of research. Um, you know, I've listened to podcasts where it's like, how can you set up a repository and not have someone manage it? Um, that, in my opinion, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> there has to be someone that has a pulse on things. Um, I'm not saying be like very in the weeds with every single project um, or every single opportunity that's happening or every single record that is in a repository, but someone has to have a pulse check on things. Um, and that goes from like building your taxonomy, making sure that tags are being properly used across the board, making sure naming conventions are not being abandoned. Those are all the things that um, create that foundation and that organizational aspect for a repository. Um, so that is where we are currently. Um, and I just I just see this continuing to build a Pindo. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Cool. So we'll move into our final question of, of this section before we move into Q&A. So thanks to everyone so far for putting in some questions here. Feel free to add some more and uh, we'll, we'll spend the last 15 minutes or so on those questions. Uh, but looking at the polls as well. So I know we have a lot of folks in the room who are research leaders uh, without any dedicated research op support. Uh, and from my conversations with some of you, uh, I've heard that this is a uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, you have a lot on your plates. You're expected not only to do your own research, evangelize research findings, consult with non-researchers, manage ops, vendors, legal, et cetera, uh, all the fun stuff. And Crystal, uh, I know this was recently your world. Uh, so as a former researcher, or sorry, research leader without ops turned into an ops leader, what's one piece of advice you can give to folks who are in this position? Oh my goodness, it was so my my life and I am so refreshed by this different focus, but the that that issue still remains. There's still more work to do than <laughs> you necessarily have time and attention to do. So the biggest thing that I could say is find your biggest pain points. As a researcher, use your own skills to figure out where those biggest pain points are and where the biggest impact could be. Pick the one thing that sets you up for success to tackle the next thing to get you the next step and it, for each of those things you can ask questions like well what can i automate 
what can I, you know, get someone, what, what can I do that, so I don't have to pay attention to this so much? What can I delegate? Is there someone else here that's doing something similar that could do this, or at least for a short term, can they do this for me? And then what can I templatize or guide? How can I make it faster to self-serve this, or for even me to get it done more quickly? Um, find that one thing, you know, do your assessment of where the biggest pain points are, um, Identify the ones that you think can have the greatest impact in setting you up to tackle the next pain point um, and use those questions of what can I automate, what can I delegate, and what can I templatize or guide to be able to address some of those pain points with limited capacity. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Put your, put your research hat on and uh, <laughs> find the most burning problem. That's a great place to start. Wonderful. Yeah, well, well, thank you both so much for uh, going through those. Uh, we have no shortage of follow-up questions, it looks like, in, in the comments and from the, uh, the survey from before. So I'll just pick a cluster here because there were a few questions that popped up around the same time while we were talking about education and enablement. Uh, and I'll, I'll start maybe this with this first question from Carolyn here. Uh, so when supporting both researchers and people who do research, how did you educate your organization about how to leverage the research ops team? What are some essentials that you built out before being ready to support your organization? Either of you wanna kick us off? I could start, I mean, I'm, I'm right here now. <laughs> My first <laughs> thing is awareness, building awareness of what the research operations function is and aligning myself very closely with our researchers who are both embedded and matrixed. So most of our teams where there are designers doing research have a research lead aligned to their, their product area that they can be the first line of defense for them and the first um, collaborator with them. And so by aligning myself, my team with the research team and funneling our questions and paying attention to the same channels, it reduces the burden of the research of people who do research outside of the research team figuring out who do I ask for what? Um, there's more work to do. There's still more awareness building that I need to do. And there's some structure that I need to put in place to help um, all of our designers figure out when to engage us and for what reasons. Awesome, awesome. Anything to, to add to that, Tiffany? No, I think that's spot on awareness. Um, I think because this is operations in itself is such a new um, area, I think, and we, some of us are researchers. Researchers don't like to put themselves out there. <laughs> I don't like to put myself out there. Um, so you're doing it right now. You're doing a great yeah, job. Yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> this was hard, right? Um, I think it's awareness. Yeah, you really just have to share like what I'm sure people get this question a lot of time. Research jobs. What is that? What do you do? Right. So I think it is awareness and being able to share that broadly um, in your organization. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great, great. Uh, just jumping to another question here, a more tactical one on the cadence that you're holding trainings on. Uh, so Michelle Miles asked this monthly, quarterly, et cetera. Curious to hear if you find live trainings more successful than self-serve docs or recorded training sessions. So uh, anything in that realm would be helpful to hear your thoughts on. Yeah, I can talk about the, the cadence that we have started using. Um, cool. we started actually for trainings, um, we started doing a lunch and learn for our broader team. Um, and I believe this was once a month, it was once a month, someone from the research team, I see Tanner nodding. Thank you, Tanner. Um, <laughs> once a month, someone from the research team hosted a topic for a lunch and learn, and it was open to our research and design team. Um, we have recently started shifting that lunch and learn to like a more close knit research team. So we can dive deeper into some very like research heavy things. Um, and then the training program that I mentioned earlier, that's that's recently been launched. We are trying to make a regular cadence of that monthly. So we don't want to annoy people. We don't want to add too much to their plate. Um, so we think monthly is going to be a good cadence for for folks to to still come and not blow us off and and get and get a lot of um, a lot of education out of it. So that's our that's our cadence currently, and we're we're still exploring that. We haven't embarked in that area yet, but um, I know some of the first topics will be around recruiting. So. Yeah. 
Cool, cool. So I'll jump into uh, a question that I, I really loved. I think all three of us loved it from the uh, uh, form that was submitted before. Uh, so what, uh, and it's a more uh, kind of thought provoking question, I guess, what difference might it have made if your role was hired earlier uh, before additional researchers? Uh, and I guess, Crystal, this one might be better for you because Tiffany, you were hired earlier <laughs> before any additional researchers. <laughs> Oh my goodness, if it was hired earlier, there would be less outreach. I would have to do less understanding of what's going on today, less variety in, in how research is being done, process that's being employed, methods that are being used, tools that are being used. There would be more that I could put in place, more, more um, expectations I could set, more guardrails and more support that I could offer so that we are off on the right foot in the beginning. Um, but that's just not the case, but we're doing, um, a, there's a lot of things that we still can do to like help out and offer support and guidance. And I just got to pick the biggest, like gnarliest issues and work on those first, but everybody's doing, you know, really great research, getting the insights that they've got challenges. There's no place that doesn't. And I'm just prioritizing those challenges. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so this one might be more relevant uh, for, for you as well, Tiffany. Uh, folks were asking, based on your experience, when do you think it makes the most sense uh, to hire the first research ops role? And then what were some friction points uh, with, with, with the rest of the org when it was actually introduced? Um, yeah, so coming before I joined Pindo, I came from a more mature UX organization. Um, mature in, in the way of uh, our ratio was much more one-to-one, -one, right? Designer, research to designer was, was very one-to-one. -one. Um, so my initial six months at Pindo, that was the opposite. Um, we had a team of one researcher and then I was new as in the ops role. Um, so the practice of UX research was, was brand new to this team and to the organization. So it was more of identifying areas for immediate impact and help. Um, so in, like we're joining an organization where designers are doing a lot of lifting when it comes to research, right? Product ops are maybe doing a lot of research when it comes, a lot of lift when it comes to uh, research. So it was more of identifying those areas for, um, like Crystal mentioned earlier, those biggest impact moments and like really showing like, I'm here to help. And like, ultimately I'm going to make your life easier and giving them time back to do what they're paid to do. Um, so you know, friction, didn't have a lot of friction. It's just more about like disruption, right? Mm -hmm. People have their way of doing their their work. They had their own Rolodex for the research, the researchers and the users that they wanted to, to research with. And as we all know, like that grows stale, that creates that echo chamber effect that you want to avoid. So for me, early development of the panel was helpful with transitioning folks from using their own Rolodex for research participation, uh, training them on tools and being proficient in those tools. Um, a lot of immediate help went into like proofing and writing questionnaires and making sure they were written in ways that weren't leading or biasing. Um, proper design for prototype evaluations, just making sure that education is there for the team and being um, there for immediate help. I would say like, some tips for just change management in general would be identifying someone on, on the research team or identifying someone on the design team that can be a champion for you um, that you can point to and say, look at, look at the impact from this person's work, right? And they can champion research, they can champion um, ops for you. That's been really instrumental to my role on the team. Um, and then also just leadership support. We all know that like change happens from top down and having that support has is critical. So having a design leader, um, you know, maybe having them incorporate in their process, asking like, where are they in the research process? Um, and just setting that new expectation is very key. And having someone do it from the top down has been very instrumental in, in our case. You're on mute, Oren. <laughs> Whoops, of course. Uh, that was bound to happen at least once. <laughs> uh, awesome. And, and how about you, Crystal? Uh, I know you've 
gave some some insight into what would have happened if your role was hired earlier. But what when do you think uh, would have been the ideal time uh, to hire to hire for for your uh, research ops leadership role? And what what were those friction points when you uh, were first introduced? Um, I'm I wouldn't say that I'm experiencing any friction points yet. I'm I'm making very few changes, but I'm being cautious because we don't want to remove anybody's ability to do research. I want, I want the improvements that we make to be of significant value, um, that if it's a behavioral change, that that behavioral change is understood to be more valuable than the, the processes that they've been going through. And there's a lot of awareness there too, to make people aware of risks that they may not be familiar with with performing certain functions in a certain way or skipping certain steps or whatever it might might be at hand but i've done some thinking about me as a research leader in other organizations and when i recognize the need that i wish we had an ops person um, to be able to help us with this and some of those things were when the number of projects requiring research exceeds the capacity of the team on an ongoing basis. There will always be pockets of time where there's more research than you can do. And that's just exceeding more and more. I think everywhere you're going, you're seeing more research than there are researchers. But not just that, also the number of projects that are focused on more generative and longitudinal research across product questions that are drawing attention from the research team and where they can provide the most rigor and value to. Um, and more evaluative and concept research is either getting less attention or forcing the research team to not give enough attention to those other generative topics. As a research leader, you can figure out and suss out when that tipping point really is. And then when designers and product managers or other people who do research are asking to do it themselves or starting to do it anyway, on a more regular basis then and having an operations function will help protect and enable that to happen um, with the impact and quality that it needs um, those are some of the signals i was thinking through of when i wish that i could have had operations is when i was noticing those things occur yeah yeah i love that last point on uh, from talking to a lot of research leaders or uh, research teams of one even as well uh, I hear a lot about the first year being a lot of, you know, pushing a boulder up a hill, uh, trying to, you know, get the word out of the value of research. And once people start to see it, it becomes this infectious thing. Everyone wants to do research for, for their uh, their work, and it starts becoming a, the boulder rolling down the hill on the other side. And now you need to, to keep up with it and put some process and, and ops in place so that it can continue scaling properly and, and uh, in the right way. Awesome. Uh, so we only have five minutes left, and we've got one last question here in our Q and A. Uh, so we'll try to use this as our last question. We'll see if we maybe have time for one more quick one from the the audience. Uh, but as a kind of finisher question, what is the most impactful thing each one of you has done to date to help elevate the research practice within your organization? Uh, Tiffany, if you want to start us off. Yeah, I can definitely start us off. Um, I think within my organization currently, the most impactful thing would be our research, our participant panel. Um, we were able to build that uh, at Pindo and kind of have it connected to this neighborhood um, marketing like package within Pindo. So it's on our website. Uh, customers can navigate to it uh, themselves but we can also invite users to it as well. So I, I worked for a company that it's really easy to recruit people in product, um, but we really needed a solution for recruiting participants and having like a pool of users who are dedicated to user research at Pindo. Um, so I think building that panel has been the most impactful thing that I've, I've done at Pindo um, for a couple of reasons, right? We don't have we are mitigating the risk for that echo chamber effect that we were having before. Um, it's more streamlined. We have a tool that houses our directory. It's our hub for all the emails that we send out, all the communications that we send out to our panelists. Um, and it also has like the guardrails in place. So we're not over communicating with our panelists. Um, so we have rules in place, contact frequency, right? We're not 
we're not asking our users to participate in research more than X times a month, or we've recent we've recently reached out to this user. It's probably <laughs> let's not invite them to another another um, research activity. So that has been like by far, I think the most impactful thing um, that that I've been able to be a part of at Pindo. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. Uh, we're we're going to be having probably many more conversations in the future about panel building and panel management. So I'm sure we'll have some some questions for for you in the the future on that. Uh, Crystal, how about yourself to to bring us home? These last yes, two I'm I'm in the early stages again, but I you know participant management is so important as a foundational thing to get stood up for any research practice that that's what I did previously and in my role as a leader before this was setting up for a b2b situation a panel that we can leverage to get access to and to kind of offload some of the the scheduling and reach out opportunity uh, activities that our team would have to normally do to scrape and find like the people that would be willing to talk to especially in an environment when you are not able to pay them um because some industries you can't do that um but here is what i'm doing that here too i am examining our current participant management panel solution i've done the service blueprint i've exposed the gaps and issues that occur right now and i'm undergoing a collaborative activity to look for a refined alternative solution that meet, better meets the needs of this democratized setting um, so that's the biggest impact I'm offering right now. It's not completed, but it's well on its way. Yeah, wonderful. Well, uh, I know there's a few questions left and we're we're just out of time. So I want to respect uh, our our panelists and all the attendees who came to join. Thank you so much for uh, the time. Uh, yeah, Chris and Tiffany, you were both amazing. So thank you for sharing all your wonderful insights. I think someone left a quote in here. This has been the most relevant and helpful reops conversation I've attended. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very glad to, to see that. It's awesome. Thanks for having us. This was fun. Thank you. Connect on LinkedIn, yeah. reach out with more questions. Always happy to hash out this space I'm passionate about. So. Absolutely. Likewise. And Thanks. if anyone wants to talk more deeply about participant management and recruitment and the Rally User Research CRM, feel free to reach out. Uh, happy to have a conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.